My name is Professor Smola Martin, and this is the Hunter Lecture in English Literature. Um, although we won't be talking about English literature this evening. Um, and this is the 26th year that we've put this on. Um, the Hunter Lecture was established um, as a memorial by the Hunter sisters uh, who lived in Marion um, uh, 26 years ago. And it's been a big boon to our community, bringing uh, authors from uh, around the country uh, into contact with FMU students and the Florence community. Um, their foresight and um, generosity uh, has bred, uh, brought authors uh, on a wide range of topics, uh, nonfiction and fiction. And uh, what else? Uh, after a little bit about what is what this is, I know many of you are freshman students and you don't know what you're doing here except that some of you are required to be here. Um, what we're doing is we're going to listen to a presentation by um, our common text author, Sarah Einstein, who's right here. Welcome her. Thank you for coming. And uh, she's going to give us a presentation. Um, and then we'll talk about uh, the, the content of the presentation and about uh, her book, Mott, which many of us read. So what you need to do is pay attention to Sarah. And that means you need to turn off your cell phones. Uh, and don't take a nap, even though it's 7.30 and you just had dinner. Um, usually, authors don't mind if you record what they're saying. Is that right? Yeah. Um, and it also should be recorded. And for those of you who want to go back and look at it, it will be available um, uh, in the Media Center uh, in a few days. <clears throat> OK. Um, so that's basically the event and the protocol. Afterwards, we'll have a book signing in the, uh, the lounge area. Um, and Sarah will be glad to sign your book. Oh, and and selling them? Is she selling them? Sarah's not a bookseller. Are you a bookseller? <laughs> do, you, do you need one? Well, she wouldn't buy one. Oh, I might have an extra one. Um, <laughs> not before they write the paper. <laughs> um, all right, so how many people in here have read Mott? Okay, good. So I'm not going to give you, I do have a whole paragraph summary of Mott, but I'm not going to waste our time with that. Um, I'll just tell you a little bit about Sarah. She's the winner of the 2014 Association of Writers and Writing Programs Award. Um, for Mott, a memoir, and it's the fruit of um, her passion, which is creative non uh, creative nonfiction. Uh, magazines like Gargoyle, Spank, and Salon have published more than a dozen of Sarah's eff essays and short fiction on topics ranging from the realities of sexual uh, sexual attraction and marriage, the classism inherent in positive thinking, and the experiences of a Jewish family living living in Appalachian, West Virginia. Her excellent work has been um, recognized by Pushcart and Best American Essays. She earned a Master's of Fine Arts from West Virginia University and a Creative Nonfiction PhD from Ohio uh, University in 2014. And currently, Sarah is teaching um, creative writing at the University of Tennessee, Chattanooga. So with that, please welcome Sarah to the podium. and. Um, Hi, I'm, I'm really excited to be here. And for those of you who had to read the book and, and didn't love it, I want to share with you my father's review of the book to make you feel a little better, which is that I, I sent my dad the book as soon as it came out. And, and the next time I went home, which was a couple weeks later, he took me out on the porch and he sat there like an Appalachian dad with his Marlboro and his sweatpants. And he said to me, Sweetheart, I love you. And I am sure this is well written. But it's not very interesting, is it? And I don't think I'm going to get past chapter three. <laughs> so for those of you for whom it was required reading who didn't love it, let me tell you that you're not alone. It's a very specific kind of book. And the kind of book it is is a kind of creative nonfiction 
Um, if you're not familiar with that term, what creative nonfiction means is that everything in the book is true, and it all comes from my own lived experience, but it's written from a subjective point of view. So it's different from journalism or other kinds of researched writing in that there are some things I cannot know, and you know that. So it's a conversational level of veracity. If I tell you this is what Mott told me about his life, for instance, you also know that Mott was a mentally ill veteran in his 60s, and that what he tells me about his life may not be the most reliable reporting. I usually give one of two talks. One of them is about a Levinasian ethic of creative nonfiction, drawing heavily on continental philosophy. And luckily for you guys, that's not the one I'm going to talk about tonight. <laughs> um, tonight I want to talk about the politics behind the book. And I really worked hard to bury this in the book. I wanted anybody to be able to come at this book and get something out of it. And I understood that if I was just all polemic all the time, all look at the way in which society has abandoned homeless people, particularly homeless veterans, that a lot of readers would never get anything out of the book. They wouldn't get very far into it. And so I tried to pull all of that back. But now I have a captive audience, and I am the kind of person who goes to women's marches and has more buttons for more causes in my car than I do leftover parking tickets, which there are a lot of too. So I want to, to explore the underlying politics and then to talk about why they, why they get subsumed in the narrative and how I hope the reader will encounter them. So for those of you who haven't read it, I'm just going to read a quick selection. Um, and the things that you need to know, Mott is a homeless, mentally ill veteran. Uh, he believes that there are old gods who live in his body. Molech, who is the Old Testament god that we associate with the golden calf, is one of them. There's one that he calls Yach, uh, who is, he thinks, a Polish Jesus. And there's several, there's also Kaiser Willy, who is some version of Kaiser Wilhelm, um, and, and a couple of other just strange characters from history that he has turned into to old gods. And they tell him what he's allowed to do, and they explain the world to him. The other group are called the Harpies, and the Harpies are women who sort of cry in the background. And they can't influence anything, but he has this constant chorus of crying going on in the background that he always hears. It's important to know that although he was a veteran, his mental illness doesn't come from his experience as a veteran. He was also a terribly abused child. Again, for those of you who haven't read the book, his mother was committed to a state hospital for the first time when, when he was six years old, she put him into a gas oven to try to kill him. Um, and then she came back two years later and resumed being his mother. And the abuse just continued through the cycle of her hospitalizations and his coming out. So he was the child of a schizophrenic who was deeply abused. What mixture of his illness was PTSD from that and dissociative disorder and what was an inherent, inherited tendency towards delusion Nobody will ever know. Um, but it was a deeply complicated mental illness. But I want to read to you about one of the few times when I knew him when he went completely sane. In this scene, Mott's in the hospital. I brought him to the ER because his blood pressure has skyrocketed to terrifying uh, numbers, which we have found out because he wanted to go to Walmart and use the blood pressure machine. And the entire time I've known Mott, he has carried aquarium tubing in his pockets. But I never knew why until we get to the hospital. And so this is from the chapter entitled, The Mystery of the Aquarium Tubing. In the hospital, the mystery of the aquarium tubing is solved. Mott's been using it to catheterize himself. I'm horrified by the difference between the thin, sterile catheters the hospital provides and the relatively thick, rigid, homemade ones he carries around in his pockets. I admire his ingenuity. I hope the loss of feeling that plagues his paralyzed side also protects him from what must otherwise be a terribly painful process. Some things a person should be able to count on, 
And if you need them, a clean supply of catheters should be one of those things. While Mott's finishing his dinner, I excuse myself to go to the bathroom and sneak out to the nurse's station. I explain Mott's situation and ask if they could give me a week's supply of catheters while I figure out how and where to buy them. His nurse refuses to give me even a few and instead harangues me for having asked as if they were expensive things and the cost of them would come directly out of her paycheck. I'm shocked by her vehemence, but in the end I have to agree with her when she insists that I've asked her to steal catheters from the hospital. Chastised, I slink back to my sleeping chair to wait for the next shift. So I hope you're not embarrassed, I say once he's done eating, but I think we should get you a supply of real catheters. I asked the nurse for some to take home, but she was pretty nurse ratchety about it. He clearly is embarrassed. No, don't worry about it. I used to get them from the VA, and if I were willing to deal with those bleep ups, I'm sure I could again. But, you know, I can't go back there, not after everything they did. He looks away and blushes. I realize that he isn't embarrassed about having to catheterize himself, but he is about the fact that he's taken to using aquarium tubing just so he doesn't have to face the VA. And maybe his embarrassment isn't such a bad thing. Maybe putting a dirty, homemade catheter through his urethra and into his bladder is something he should rethink. Mott became estranged from the VA after a surgery to remove a benign tumor from his spine at the base of his skull. I don't know the details, but now that I, now that I know that it cost him access to medical supplies he needs daily, I need him to explain it to me. In his version of the story, a nurse dropped him while he was being transferred from the gurney to a bed after surgery, and he lashed out at her, angry and frightened. It wasn't me, he said. I mean, it wasn't, I wasn't the one doing the talking and the threatening. And here's, here's where the illness comes in. If you've seen more of the book, you would make sense that sometimes when he's acting out, he, he says it's not him. It's one of the people inside him. Um, but I could hear it. But what would you do? You've just had major surgery, you have sutures along your spine, and the slob drops you. I mean, wouldn't you be mad? Of course I would. I say, certain that this can't be the whole story. They red flagged you just for that? No, for that, they just gave me a warning. Afterward, they sent me to this halfway house where I was supposed to recuperate, but they couldn't take me because I couldn't walk up and down stairs. Said the VA knew that and shouldn't have sent me. So they just put me out. I mean, here I was, bandages and stitches and everything with no place to go. I had a bunch of appointments at the VA I had to risk, I had to keep or risk being paralyzed, so I couldn't just leave town. I nod, more disturbed by how possible the story sounds than anything. So I figured the best place for me, for me was on the grounds of the VA. I mean, I could barely walk. Uh, sorry, I mean, I could barely walk. The VA was a ways out of sight of town and hard to get to and from. You could call a van to pick you up, but I didn't have a phone or an address, so what was I supposed to do? Mott looks at me, and I nod. He often checks to be certain what he is saying is reasonable, particularly when someone else has suggested that it isn't. So anyway, this guard saw me and told me I had to leave. I tried to explain it to him, but he didn't care. I mean, I know he was just doing his job, but I don't like being run off, so I refused to go. He called another guard and things got a little physical, but really it took two guards to get me out the gate and I was pretty beaten up from the surgery. Can you imagine? He whistles. Anyway, they red flagged me after that. Said if I wanted to come back, I had to first call and arrange to have an armed escort at all times. He throws up his hands in a gesture of defeat. And I mean, I wasn't gonna do that, that's ridiculous. So I just decided not to have anything else to do with them. But what about the catheters? Don't you need them? Mott glares at me. I said, I'm not gonna have anything else to do with those bleep ups, and that's that, done deal. What are you, some kind of government shill? I let it drop, grateful at least for the hint. His illness plays fair most of the time. Before Mott is made to believe a thing about me, that I'm a government shill or whatever, uh, I'm sorry, that I'm a government shill or that I want to force his surrender, it usually gives me a warning. 
I suspect that eventually I'll miss one or one too many, and then delusion will cut the bond between us. But today, I'm glad to have the trap pointed out, and I step gingerly around it. Okay, but I'm going to ask for extra catheters again. Maybe I can talk to a different nurse this time. I'll be back in a little bit. Mott nods and closes his eyes. I stand by the curtain a moment, watching him fall asleep. The long, slender scar that runs from the base of his skull to between his shoulder blades is visible between the, between the open back of the hospital gown. I try to imagine what it would be like to recover from such a dramatic surgery while sleeping on the ground outside a VA hospital in New England during the cold part of spring. But I can't. Privilege protects me from understanding that kind of suffering. But I'm angrier than I know how to be and keep still. I ask the nurse for a single catheter and follow her as she retrieves it. She's put a box of them right at the right side of the station. She very pointedly hands me only one. If he needs another, she says, you have him ring his bell, and I'll bring it. No need for you to be prowling around here after them. But I am. I walk to the door as if I'm headed to the cafeteria, but as soon as she's gone, I'm at the box, cramming handful after handful into my purse. <coughs> Some things are worth stealing. And in some ways, I wrote this whole book so that I could tell that story. Because that story makes me really angry. That's a story about an American veteran who, in order to pee, has to stick dirty aquarium tubing through his penis into his bladder. Because he was kicked out of the VA trying to find some way to be able to get the health care he needed after they put him in a halfway house that would not keep him and then had no provision to make other arrangements for him. And that, that's wrong, right? I, I think no matter how, gosh, pick yourself up by your own bootstraps we are, we can agree that's pretty wrong, right? And so I started to look into homelessness more, particularly veteran homelessness, after I met Mott. And I discovered some really startling things. I mean, did you know that we didn't even use the phrase homeless until the mid-1980s? There were people, there were populations that we talked about who were often homeless. There were hobos and tramps who by, by for instance, are different communities. Hobos and tramps are not the same. And they're different kind of tramps. They're rubber tramps who hitchhike. They're leather tramps who walk. But we didn't have this concept of homelessness. And a couple of things happened that made us begin to lump all of these different communities of impoverished people together. The first is that in the 1930s, the government got into the business of building low-income housing. And in the 1970s, it got out of it. And when it was in the business of building low-income housing, it built housing that was accessible to people across a broad spectrum of income levels. If you had no income, there was support. And if you were living within 400% of the federal poverty level, you could get housing subsidies in these federal housing projects. When we stopped building physical buildings, we moved instead to a voucher system. Some of you might have heard it called Section 8, although there have been a couple different kinds of voucher systems uh, started. And a lot fewer people were eligible. And you could wait years to get a Section 8 voucher, depending on where you lived and how much housing there was, because there was no mandate for anybody to build new low-income housing. This was a voucher that would help you get into it, but there was no requirement that any landlord or any civic authority actually build the housing for you to live in. And in some towns, that inventory kept shrinking and shrinking. But it wasn't really all that available to most veterans anyway because it was really hard to qualify if you were male. And before this shrinkage, before the 80s, single men instead lived in what we called SROs, or single residence occupancy hotels. And you, if, in the popular parlance, they're called flop houses. Okay? And they were these big, you'd have a room, you might have a sink in your room, you had a shared bathroom, 
There might be a shared room with a hot plate and stuff in it. You paid a few dollars a night, and you paid by the day. And it's where guys like Mott, who got by most of his life doing day labor, right? He'd go stand in the parking lots of things like Lowe's, and guys would come up and say, so I need two guys to help me with this project today, and I'll pay you $8 an hour and a six pack of beer when it's over. And you went and you did that, and you went back to your SRO, and you gave the landlord your couple of dollars for that night. Maybe you paid three or four nights forward if you could afford it. That's how those people found housing. In the 1980s, that just collapsed. Chicago is the only city to have done a major study that actually counted the number of rooms they lost. Chicago lost over 90% of those rooms. Nationwide, we think about 81% of them were lost and that's millions. And there was no other housing option that was available to single men who did not qualify for Section 8 housing. We just didn't have any other programs. And so in the 80s, we started talking about homelessness because suddenly all of the people who had lived in these SROs were instead living by our riverbanks and under our bridges and in our city parks. And they weren't any more poor than they had been when the SROs were open. They just no longer had any place that they could afford to live. And we stopped talking about housing them. And we started talking about putting them in homeless shelters. And we started building shelters. And when we built shelters, we kind of stopped worrying about what happens next. It was about where is somebody going to sleep tonight? And housing for veterans was particularly problematic because what programs there were you could be disqualified for for two reasons that particularly impact veterans. Really hard to get that housing if you're disabled because there are a bunch of special rules for low income housing for disabled people. And if there was not very much inventory for low income housing for the general population, there was often almost none for people with disabilities. Landlords didn't want to deal with it, and the government wasn't buying any of it. The other is that if you've ever had a, a felony conviction for any kind of drug crime, you cannot receive housing assistance from the federal government, and all the, head of the housing assistance was tied back to a federal program. And veterans come back from war theaters with a much higher rate of addiction than the general population, often for reasons that have to do with the way opiates are overprescribed to injured soldiers in order to get them back on the battlefield. And these two things combined to make a particular crisis in veteran housing. And usually when I give this talk, I end there and I talk about how we have to fix this. But I did a little research before I got here because I wanted to know where we are now. And I found out something that really surprised me and something I'm really worried we're going to lose. And I hope we don't. And I hope I can encourage you to take this up and pay attention to it. And I, I swear I didn't know this until about three days ago. In the last eight years, veteran homelessness has fallen 47%. And it didn't fall because Vietnam veteran era, uh, Vietnam era veterans died, which is one of the things that sometimes you will hear because the numbers were adjusted for that aging population. And it didn't fall because they did some tricky thing where they decided to redefine homelessness. It fell because 40,000 of the 80 plus thousand homeless veterans in this country were housed. And they were housed under new programs started by the Obama administration. And that's really, frankly, kind of amazing. We've never had a 50% reduction in any homeless population since we started talking about this in the 80s. And we've had big targeted efforts, particularly to try to keep children out of homelessness. And we have never had this kind of success. And somehow it's a secret. And so I want to tell you this secret. Because South Carolina is a state with a lot of people who go into the service. You probably have brothers, fathers, uncles, grandfathers who served. And it turns out we're actually doing something right. right? When I wrote the book, I only had anger. But it turns out we're actually doing something right. And I really hope we keep doing it. And that's so much easier than coming here and saying, so I really hope you'll help me do something about this. I just really hope you'll help me make sure we keep doing something about it, which is way better. Mm -hmm.